you. New Year should be a time of optimism and excitement. Yet I know many of you look ahead to 2023 with apprehension. I want you to know that as your Prime Minister, I will work night and day to change that, and quickly. Not just by providing relief and peace of mind for the months to come, although we will, but also by changing our country and building a better future for our children and grandchildren. A future that restores optimism, hope, and pride in Britain. Let me first address two issues that I know at the forefront of everyone's minds. I know there are challenges in A&E. People are understandably anxious when they see ambulances queuing outside hospitals. You should know we're taking urgent action, increasing bed capacity by 7,000 more hospital beds and more people cared at home, providing new funding to discharge people into social care in the community, freeing up beds, and the NHS are working urgently on future plans for A&E and ambulances. And on strikes, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So I want people to clearly understand the government's position. We hugely value public sector workers like nurses. They do incredibly important work. And that's why we want a reasonable dialogue with the unions about what's responsible and fair for our country. And in the coming days, we will update you on the government's next steps. Today, I want to make a simple commitment. This government will always reflect the people's priorities. People don't want politicians who promise the earth and then fail to deliver. They want government to focus less on politics and more on the things they care about. The cost of living, too high. Waiting times in the NHS, too long. Illegal migration, far too much. I think people do accept that many of these challenges are at least in part the legacy of COVID and impacted by the war in Ukraine. But that's not an excuse. We need to address these problems, not just talk about them. And since I became Prime Minister, we've made progress stabilised the economy and people's mortgage rates, provided £26 billion of support for the cost of living, invested billions more in schools, the NHS and social care, deepened ties with allies around the world on everything from Ukraine to our collective economic security, continued our unwavering support for the armed forces and their efforts to keep us safe, and set out a concrete plan to stop the boats and tackle the unfairness of illegal migration. But of course, we need to do more. So I want to make five promises to you today, five pledges to deliver peace of mind, five foundations on which to build a better future for our children and grandchildren. First, we will halve inflation this year to ease the cost of living and give people financial security. Second, we will grow the economy, creating better paid jobs and opportunity right across the country. Third, we will make sure our national debt is falling so that we can secure the future of public services. Fourth, NHS waiting lists will fall and people will get the care they need more quickly. Fifth, we will pass new laws to stop small boats, making sure that if you come to this country illegally, you are detained and swiftly removed. So, five promises. We will halve inflation, grow the economy, reduce debt, cut waiting lists and stop the boats. Those are the people's priorities. They are your government's priorities and we will either have achieved them or not. No tricks, no ambiguity. We're either delivering for you or we're not. 
We will rebuild trust in politics through action, or not at all. So I ask you to judge us on the effort that we put in and the results that we achieve. Now, these five promises are the people's priorities. So they're my immediate priorities too. But they're not the limit of my ambitions for our country. They're the foundation. My aim is to build a better future for our children and grandchildren, a future where they feel optimism, hope, and pride. And to realize that vision, we need to change our mindset. Now, politicians talk a lot about change. But the truth is, no government, no prime minister, can change a country by force of will or diktat alone. Real change isn't provided. It's created. It's not given. It's demanded. Not granted, but invented. The choices we make as individuals, as workers, business owners, parents, all add up to something far greater. And if we're honest, change also requires sacrifice and hard work. It's a big risk for a politician to say that, but the stakes are too high and the rewards too great not to level with you. So change is hard. It takes time, but it is possible. And we know that because we've done it before. During COVID, we protected millions of people's jobs and businesses, a record I'm proud of. And we know it's possible because you can see change happening. You can feel it. Just look at our state schools, empowered by reform in some of the most deprived parts of the country, producing some of the best results. Those teachers and pupils work hard and make sacrifices because they know that what they are doing is bigger than themselves. They demand, inspire, and deliver excellence. And their ethos of excellence can become the animating spirit of our nation. Inspired by them, together we can change our country's character. We can reverse the creeping acceptance of a narrative of decline, reject pessimism and fatalism, refuse limits on our aspirations, and to do that, we need to have the imagination and confidence to do things differently and better. The vision to do today what is needed for tomorrow. In other words, we need to change the way our country works. That requires a change in mindset. And what does that mean in practice? It means a more innovative economy stronger communities and safer streets, a world-class education system, an NHS built around patients, and a society that truly values the family. In all these areas and more, we must have the courage to change, to think bigger, strive for excellence, not give up when things get tough. And if we can do that, then we really can build a better future. In the coming months, I will set out our plans in each of these areas, but let me set the direction today. A better future is one where our economy is growing faster so that everybody, everywhere across our union has new opportunities for better paying, good jobs. And the change we need is to put innovation at the heart of everything we do an ethos embodied by so many of the fantastic businesses right here at Plexel. Now, some people think innovation is about gadgets and geekery, a nice to have, peripheral to growth compared to the traditional levers of tax and spend. But that is exactly the mindset that we need to change. Let me tell you why innovation is so important. Over the last 50 years, it was responsible for around half of the UK's productivity increase. New jobs are created by innovation. People's wages increased by innovation. The cost of goods and services reduced by innovation. And major challenges like energy security and net zero will be solved by innovation. The more we innovate, 
the more we grow. And the world is seeing an incredible wave of scientific and technological change. So right now, the most powerful way to achieve higher growth is to make sure the UK is the most innovative economy in the world. And that's why we're increasing public funding in R&D to £20 billion to enhance our world-leading strengths in AI, life sciences, quantum, fintech and green technology, seizing the opportunities of Brexit to ensure our regulatory system is agile and pro-innovation, making sure entrepreneurial and fast-growing companies get the finance they need to expand, spreading a culture of creative thinking and doing things differently across every part of the UK. If we're going to deliver this better future, people will have to work hard. But I believe good, well-paid jobs are about more than just financial security. They give people purpose, confidence, dignity, the chance to build a better life from themselves. But I also believe that if you work hard and play by the rules, you should be rewarded. And which is why, as soon as we can, the government will reduce the burden of taxation on working people. And it is staggering that at a time when businesses are crying out for workers, a quarter of our labour force is inactive. So our growth plan will look at how we can support those who can to move back into work, including through the welfare system. Now, all of this will make this country a beacon of science, technology, and enterprise, and lift our productivity, raise our growth rate, and create jobs in the decades to come. Good jobs give people pride in their own lives. But a better future also means reinforcing people's pride in the places they call home. And the change we need is to do away with the idea that it's inevitable that some communities and some places can never and will never get better. I love my local community, and it's not right that too many for far too long have not felt that same sense of meaning and belonging. A government can't create it. It's something that we build together. But the state does provide the foundations. So we will deliver on our promise to level up with greater investment in local areas, to boost growth, create jobs, and reinvigorate our high streets and town centers. But all the regeneration in the world won't mean anything unless people feel safe in their communities. So by this spring, we'll have an extra 20,000 police officers patrolling the streets, answering the call for help, and catching criminals. We've got to stop violence against women and girls. And let's be frank, that means men taking responsibility for creating a culture and society where women are safe in their communities and at home. We've got to reduce reoffending because a small number of career criminals account for disproportionate amounts of crime. And we've got to beat addiction because heroin and crack addicts account for almost half of all robberies. Strong communities are also built on values. On the golden rule, treat others as you would like to be treated yourself. But too often, a small minority break that golden rule. They spray graffiti on war memorials, discard needles and nitrous oxide canisters in children's playgrounds gang together and cause disorder and disruption. Antisocial behavior isn't inevitable or a minor crime. It makes life miserable for so many, and it can be a gateway to more extreme crimes. So this government will work tirelessly to crack down on antisocial behavior, giving police forces, mayors, and local authorities the tools they need and giving communities confidence that these crimes will be quickly and visibly punished. Wherever you live, in our United Kingdom, you should be able to feel proud of your community, and that's 
what will work together to achieve. So we will create a better future by changing our economy and strengthening our communities. We also need greater social justice. And the way we achieve that is education. This is personal for me. Every opportunity I've had in life began with the education I was so fortunate to receive. And it's the single most important reason why I came into politics, to give every child the highest possible standard of education. Thanks to the reforms we've introduced since 2010 and the hard work of so many excellent teachers, we've made incredible progress. But with the right plan, the right commitment to excellence, I cannot see any reason why we can't rival the best education systems in the world. To do that, yes, we'll need to fix the damage of COVID, especially for our youngest pupils. And yes, it will require more investment, which is why just a few weeks ago in the autumn statement, we provided two billion pounds of extra funding for schools. But that's not the limit of our ambitions. We're not content with just catching up. First, we need to support good teaching and spread best practice with a plan to improve attainment in primary schools. Next, we need to stop seeing education as something that ends age 18 or that sees university as the only option with more technical education, lifelong learning and apprenticeships. And one of the biggest challenges in mindset we need in education today is to reimagine our approach to numeracy. As Chancellor, I introduced Multiply, a new program to give hundreds of thousands of adults the opportunity to get the basic numerical skills they need. But we're one of the few countries not to require our children to study some form of maths up to the age of 18. Right now, just half of all 16 to 19 year olds study any maths at all. Yet in a world where data is everywhere and statistics underpin every job, Letting our children out into that world without those skills is letting our children down. So we need to go further. I am now making numeracy a central objective of our education system. Now that doesn't have to mean a compulsory A-level in maths for everyone, but we will work with the sector to move towards all children studying some form of maths to 18. Just imagine what greater numeracy will unlock for people. The skills to feel confidence with your finances, to find the best mortgage deal or savings rate. The ability to do your job better and get paid more and greater self-confidence to navigate a changing world. Improving education is the closest thing to a silver bullet there is. It's the best economic policy the best social policy, the best moral policy, and that's why it's this government's policy. Now, as we build this better future for our children and grandchildren, I feel a deep responsibility to pass on a health service that will be there for them, just as it was for our parents and grandparents. When I talk about the NHS, I'm not just talking about a prized public service. I'm talking about my family's life calling. My dad was a doctor. I grew up working in my mum's pharmacy. I saw day in, day out, the devotion they gave to their patients. And my record demonstrates how important those memories are to me. We've significantly increased funding for health and social care, recruited thousands more doctors and nurses, upgraded more hospitals with cutting-edge technology. But COVID has imposed massive new pressures and people are waiting too long for the care they need. And we're fixing that, but we need to do more. At a time when we're putting record sums into the NHS and recruiting record numbers of doctors and nurses, healthcare professionals are still unable to deliver the care they want and patients aren't receiving the care they deserve. So we need to recognize that something has to change. Now, it doesn't mean structural reforms to the NHS. 
We will always protect the founding principles of an NHS free at the point of use. But what it does mean is an NHS where patients are in control with as much choice as possible. Where we're comfortable with the NHS using more independent capacity, if that's what it takes to get patients quicker and better care. Where patients can access more information and data, allowing them to make more informed choices and hold services to account. And where we will no longer accept unwarranted variation in performance between trusts because high quality healthcare should be there for you wherever you live. And as the NHS works with professions to develop a workforce strategy early this year, I've asked them to consider how we can best support doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals like pharmacists to work more flexibly. We all share the same objective when it comes to the NHS to continue providing high quality, responsive healthcare for generations to come. And that's what we're going to deliver. Our vision for change will revitalize every aspect of our lives. Better jobs, stronger communities, world-class education, an NHS built around patients. But family is something politicians struggle to talk about because you can all too readily be pilloried for being out of touch, or worse, hostile, to those who don't conform to some idealized form. We live in a world today where family can and does take many forms. But whatever your family looks like, it doesn't matter as long as the common bond is love. We shouldn't be shy about it. We cannot not talk about the thing that is most important in most of our lives. Not when the evidence is clear that strong, supportive families make for more stable communities and happier individuals. I wouldn't be where I am today without the love of my family, the kindness they gave me, the sacrifices they made for me, the values they taught me. I learned from them the virtues of hard work and self-improvement, the importance of treating others with respect, the value of service, of how a community relies on people going above and beyond what they are required to do. Today, it is the love of my wife and children that sustains me in the most difficult moments in this job. Family matters. We need to support parents to manage the demands of modern workplaces without weakening the irreplaceable bonds of family life. And we're going to roll out family hubs to offer parents the support they need to raise a child. Because I believe deeply that family, not just government, can help us answer the profound questions we face as a country. When it comes to health, family cares for us when we were sick and old. Family teaches us values in education. When it comes to community, family guides us in right and wrong. And that's why family runs right through our vision of a better future. When I first spoke to you as Prime Minister, I stressed that trust was not given, but earned. I hope that in these first few weeks in the job, I have begun to earn your trust. And I've made five promises today to deliver peace of mind. We will halve inflation, grow the economy, reduce debt, cut waiting times, and stop the boats. But I know this is just the start of what we need to do to build a better Britain together. As well as peace of mind today, this afternoon I've also set out a vision for a better future for our children and grandchildren. Now we're not going to get there overnight, or even in this parliament, but this is the journey we are on. And despite all the challenges we face, all the anxieties that people feel, I know we can get there. Others may talk about change. I will deliver it. I won't offer you false hope or quick fixes, but meaningful, lasting change. I want people to feel something that they do not always feel today, a belief that public services work for them, a knowledge that if you work hard in the good times, the state will be there for you during the bad, a hope that the world will be better for their children than it was for them, 
a sense of belonging in the place they call home. I guarantee that your priorities will be my priorities. I pledge that I will be honest about the challenges we face and I will take the tough but necessary decisions to ensure our great country achieves its enormous potential. I will only promise what I can deliver and I will deliver what I promise. Thank you. Thank you. Right, I think we've uh, got a good amount of time to take some questions from the media. Why don't I kick off Chris Mason from the BBC. Prime Minister, thank you. Chris Mason, BBC News. Um, the health service is under extraordinary pressure right now, and some people watching this this afternoon might say, is that it? How soon will things improve in the NHS this winter? Thanks, Chris. Look, I, as I acknowledged right at the beginning of the speech, I think that's the thing that people are most worried about. And it's why when I talked about my five priorities, the five promises that I made to the country, making sure that we reduce waiting times in the NHS was one of them. Uh, it's something I've been working on a lot since I was PM, and that's why I want the country to hold me account for delivering it. Now, there are lots of things we are doing. This winter, for example, the most acute pressure we have is in A&E, and we can see that. So what I want the country to know is there are a range of things we're doing that will make a difference. The, the, the biggest problem we have is that there are, at the moment, around 13,000 people in hospital beds who ideally should be back in their communities or in social care. And that's what's making sure our hospitals full, and that's what's slowing the, the flow of people from ambulances into A&E and through. So what are we doing to address that? Well, we've put half a billion pounds into what's called early discharge to help move people into the communities this winter. We're rolling out something called virtual wards, which are where people, for example, who have acute respiratory infections can actually be treated at home with telemedicine or pulse oximeters, which will free up capacity in the NHS. We're rolling out a new fall service so that we can save about 55,000 ambulance call-outs a year by treating people with falls at home. And we need to do a better job in preventative medicine. So many people with undiagnosed high blood pressure who end up ultimately having a cardiac issue that requires an ambulance call out. So those are just some of the things that we're doing this winter that I am confident will make a difference. We also have a plan in place to get NHS waiting times when it comes to elective surgery down. And, and that's something that I'm confident we can do. Uh, and we will, you know, by, I, I believe, in just a few months of practically eliminated waiting times for those waiting a year and a half. We've already eliminated those waiting two years, and by next spring, I think, we'll have eliminated those waiting a year. And that's because we've got a clear plan in place. But what I want the country to know is this is an absolute priority for me. I made five promises today, and making sure that people can get the care that they need as quickly as they need it is right there as one of those priorities. The country should hold me to account for delivering it, and I'm confident that we will. Next, Carl Dinan from ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, just on that point about having fewer people in hospital and not more, paramedics tell us that you might even have to consider pausing elective procedures in order to allow them to get people in the front door, as it were, of hospitals. Isn't this the wrong time to be concentrating on waiting lists when there are queues of ambulances trying to get people who need urgent care into hospital? Well, Carl, the simple answer is we need to do both, right? And you heard my answer to Chris. There's a range of things we're doing that are going to make the most difference in the short term to A&E and urgent care. And, and as I said, the most, the most impressing priority we have is, is to move people into social care and into the communities. That will mean that we can actually get ambulances flowing as fast as we would like and make sure that people are moving into A&E as quickly as we would like them to be seen. But your point on electives actually highlights the issue. That's what we shouldn't do. Right? And that's what happened during COVID. We stopped doing elective surgery. Right? The amount of elective activity in the NHS was down to about half of what it normally does. So the reason we've got a huge waiting list now is because we're having to catch up with that. And actually, one of our initiatives to stop that from happening again 
is to create what are called elective surgical hubs and community diagnostic centers where people can get all the scans and the tests they need and indeed the elective routine elective surgery like hip replacements and cataracts away from the acute part of a hospital. Because if you do that, what you do is really increase our ability to treat people because you don't have doctors constantly disrupted by doing routine appointments and then having to rush to deal with an emergency. That's the model that works really well. We're rolling out 300 community diagnostic centers and elective surgical hubs across the country and that will allow us to do both. It will allow us to treat our parents, grandparents that are waiting for one of those surgeries that they need, but it will also allow us to treat people in hospitals who need that urgent care. So, you know, my priority is to do both, and I think the plans we've got in place will deliver it, and that's why we put more funding into the NHS. You can't forget that. Just a couple of months ago, the autumn statement, we had to make some very difficult decisions as a government to get our debt under control, to make sure that we control inflation. But in spite of all of those things, we put extra money into the NHS and social care, 14 billion pounds over the next two years. Now we need to make sure that we deliver that money in the way that I've described so that people feel the benefit in the care that they and their families receive. And uh, we've got a clear plan to do it. My job is to deliver it. And then I want people to hold me for account for it. That's one of the five promises I made today. Beth Rigby from Sky. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister, look, we know to expect a reassuring uh, performance from you, but in the real world, you can't get a train, you can't get a doctor's appointment, nurses are going to food banks, and when you do dial 999, you can't be sure that an ambulance is going to get there in time to save your loved one. That's the reality of Britain in 2023. And now you're here giving people more promises about how you might change the country that they've heard many times before during 13 years of conservative rule. My question really is, why should the public believe you're any different to any of your predecessors? Well, Beth, I think the country has seen me perform in the job before through really difficult times. They saw me as chancellor during COVID. In fact, most of them probably didn't know who I was until I appeared on that press conference on their TV screens. And I'm proud of the record that I have as chancellor. I think we moved at enormous speed and with competence to actually deliver interventions that made a difference to people's lives, that saved their jobs, protected their businesses. And so people can trust that when I say I'm gonna do something, I am gonna do it. I think the second thing is, I've been very clear, as I said today, unambiguous. I made five very simple promises. The country's priorities are my priorities. I want to be held account for them. I'm, there's no ambiguity about them. There's no tricks. People will know whether I'm delivering on these things. And I'm confident that we can. Uh, I really am. And you talk about the record. You know, actually, look, I'm not going to say the, the NHS wasn't under any pressure before COVID. Of course it was. But that, you know, there were places where things were really improving. And you look at ambulance times, for example, Category 2, we are just about at target before COVID hit. And it's undeniable, though, that COVID has had an impact. I talked about the fact that elective surgery was paused during COVID. You can look at the same with cancer referrals. They were down by a third or two thirds during COVID. Uh, and now, obviously, there are far more than normal, right? So that's why that's not performing as well as we would like it to, but it's improving. So look, COVID has had an impact. It's not an excuse. This is one of my five promises. People know what I did for them during COVID as chancellor. And that's why I'm here today being very clear about what I'm going to deliver for them and the country as prime minister. I'm very confident we can do that. But ultimately, people will hold me to account for doing so. Right. Olivia Utley from GB News. improve so I, I was very clear about the importance of family to me and actually I think it's it's good that we talk about family because it's a wonderful thing that we should talk about more and I specifically talked about part of modern families today is making sure that we can balance between work life and, and family life and childcare is obviously an important part of that uh, the government and I am completely committed to ensuring good availability and affordability and flexibility of childcare that's what we're always looking to deliver and improve on the offers that we have. There's a consultation that is out at the moment, and we're in the process considering about some reforms, and it wouldn't be right for me to comment on that now. But the fact that I've spent time talking about family hopefully gives you and everyone some confidence that it is important to me, and we want to make sure that we support families 
in all their forms it, to have happy, fulfilling lives that are filled with love and nurturing for their children in the same way that I was fortunate to benefit from. Gary Gibbon from Channel 4 News. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, could I just, uh, in, in the interest of clearing up any ambiguity, clarify which of these pledges are for this year? Um, halving inflation this year, you said, in line with most forecasts, including the OPR. What about the others? Growing the economy mm -hmm. this year? NHS waiting lists falling this year? You said new laws to stop small boats. Well, maybe you could do that this year, but would you stop small boats this year? And could I ask uh, an, another question? Over recent months, years, actually, Britain's often been uh, compared with Italy and the political and economic crises that happened there. They've occasion occasionally had, uh, to restore calm, a technocrat who's taken over. Are you our technocrat? It's Gary, on, on the five, the five promises I made, let me just say, inflation, the plan is very much, and the, my expectation is that we will be able to half the rate of inflation by the end of this year. Uh, on our path, by the way, to restoring inflation back to where it belongs, which is 2% inflation target that we set the Bank of England. You know, but I'm keen to deliver on the plans that we've set out that we'll see inflation halving, as I said, by the end of this year. And at the same time, I'd like the economy to be growing by then as well. So those two goals are both for this year. In terms of debt falling, we already have got plans in place to make sure that debt does fall in the medium term. The key is sticking to those and making sure that we have the discipline uh, to do so, because that's not always easy, but it's the right thing to do to secure the future of public services and indeed to combat inflation. Uh, and then regard to NHS waiting times. So last year, we practically eliminated people waiting over two years. Uh, because of the plans that we've put in place that increase the amount of elective activity we have that I talked a little bit about, uh, we, will, you know, we are on track to eliminate the waits for one and a half years, practically, by about April of this year. And by spring of next year, we will have practically have eliminated those waiting over a year with the overall waiting list falling. And then lastly, we're keen to introduce legislation as soon as practically possible. Ultimately, Parliament uh, decides how long it takes to pass that legislation. Um, but in all of these things... Look, I, you know, I've deliberately not put a specific month on, on each of them because I don't think that's responsible or, or the right thing to do with, with goals that are so complicated where many of the forces that will impact our ability to hit them are, are out of my control as well, right? And we've seen that over the past year or two. Uh, but what I am being very clear about is what I am prioritising, what I am keen to deliver for the country in terms that I think are easy to understand and unambiguous. I fully expect the country to hold me and the government to account for how much effort we're putting in to working on those priorities, which are their priorities, and then ultimately, you know, how and when we deliver them. But that's why I'm being crystal clear about what we're doing and why. I, I, in the interest of time, actually, I think, well, hopefully you, you can digest the speech in, in longer time, but I think the country at the moment has a very clear set of priorities that they want their government to focus on. Those are the five promises I made. It's about halving inflation, growing the economy, reducing debt, cutting waiting times, and stopping the boats. Those are our five immediate priorities. But also today, I sketched out the better future for our children and grandchildren that I want to create. That is not the work of, as I said, one year or one parliament, but that is the journey that I want our country to go on, and I'm really confident that we can make good progress on that as well. In the interest of trying to get as many of your colleagues in as possible, I'll ask people just to limit themselves to one question, if that's OK going forward. Um, ben Riley-Smith from The Telegraph. Thank you, Prime Minister. One question with an A and a B, if that's all right. Your, <laughs> your, your plan for growth, uh, you said you wanted to reduce the tax burden. I know you're not going to set the spring budget here, but how likely do you think it is you might be able to reduce the tax burden with the spring budget? And also, you talked about getting people back into work. Could you give me one specific policy idea, a new policy idea you're looking at to do that? Well, I think, Ben, on, on both of those, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to preempt what the Chancellor does in the spring budget. I certainly preferred it when I had his job, when the Prime Minister didn't do that. And I'll try and, uh, I'll try and stick by that. Um, but look, I, well, I, I repeat what I said in the speech. I, I think work is really important. It, it's important not just because it provides financial security. Of course, it does that for, for us and our families. But I think work provides people with purpose, provides them with dignity and confidence. It's something to be celebrated and rewarded, which is why, as soon as we are able to, I want to cut 
taxes on working people. That's something that uh, I think the Chancellor is also aligned on. But right now, we've got a set of challenges that we're grappling with, and that's a priority, as, I, um, as I've outlined. Uh, and, and with regard to inactivity, that there's a range of things that we are looking at that the Chancellor and the Work and Pension Secretary are working on together. And there's, again, with all of these things, there's no one thing that will make the difference. There's probably a range of things. But as I mentioned in the speech, you know, we need to look at how our welfare system is operating. And is it operating in the way that we would like to make sure that we are supporting, incentivizing people who can be to be in work? And you know, that's the work that we started some of, uh, but clearly there's lots of options that we can look at there. And that's why I mentioned it specifically. And but as I said, the budget is a time for these types of things, and, and the Chancellor will make those uh, announcements in, in due course. Uh, Steve Swinford from The Times. Um, Prime Minister, you've said that you want to stop the boats. Can I ask, what exactly do you mean by that? Do you mean, or do you mean that there will just be fewer small boat crossings, just to get some definition around that key delivery target of yours? Yeah. So, Steve, I think ultimately the country will judge, as I said, right? The country will be the judge of whether we as a government are straining every sinew to focus on their priorities and deliver meaningful progress and change on them. Now, when I, when I made a statement in Parliament last month about small boats, I, you know, I went out of my way to say, look, this is not an easy problem to fix, right? And it's not one that we can fix overnight, and it requires lots of different uh, things to be changed. Now, we've made progress on that already. The new deal with France means that there's 40% more patrols happening in France, uh, which is making a difference to us. The new deal with Albania will enable us to return more illegal migrants who have come here from that country back to where uh, they're from. You know, they, they account for a third of all small boat crossings uh, in the latter part of last year. So that can make a really big difference. Uh, but the most important thing we need to do is pass new legislation. And we want to make sure that that new legislation means that if you come here illegally to our country, you will not be able to stay. You will be detained and swiftly removed back to a safe country or um, your own home, if that's appropriate. That's the type of system that I think makes sense. I think it's an extraordinarily common sense. I think everyone watching will think that's the type of system we should have. Um, but as we've seen already with our Rwanda policy, there are plenty of people who will try and stop that from happening. But what I want to make sure that the country knows is I'm working day and night to deliver that system, and the next step on that journey is to introduce new laws that will allow us to put that system in place. But that is not going to happen overnight, but that is what people will see us working very hard on uh, in the coming weeks and months. Jason Groves from The Mail. Thanks, Pierre. Um Don't you have to resolve the strikes that are going on if you're going to get peace of mind uh, and get the growth that you want? And how are you going to do that uh, without paying people more, um, do you think you can legislate your way out of this problem? Well, thanks, Jason. Uh, look, on strikes, I really want to make sure the country and everyone understands the government's position, and that is that you know, we hugely respect and value the work done by our public sector workers across the board, but obviously uh, nurses are a part of that as well, and a special part of that. And I also want everyone to know that we, we're very keen on dialogue. The government's door is always open. The transport sector secretary's door you know, we're very keen to have constructive two-way dialogue that's honest that's open where we can talk about the challenges everyone's facing and see what we can all do to find a resolution to these strikes you know I've always I've always been clear about that and I wanted to reiterate that today now you know you, I've, I've said in this that you'll hear more from the government in the coming days about our approach but look, my view is you know people should always behave reasonably and fairly and make sure that what we're doing is centered around what's responsible for the country, what's affordable for the country. Uh, I think that's the right dialogue to be having, and I hope we can have that dialogue. But I've also said, much as I, I celebrate and value the work of unions in our society, they play an important role and people should have the right to strike, that has to be balanced with the right of the British public to be able to go about their lives without suffering completely uh, undue disruption in the way that we've seen recently. And that's why I said we will introduce new legislation that restores that balance and crucially protects people's lives as well as their livelihoods. Uh, but you'll hear more, more from the government in the coming days on that. Ryan Saby, The Sun. Prime Minister, um, you recently said that you had two years to turn things around. Today you say, judge me. If you don't get your priorities right and get things done, will the public have every right to send you packing? Well, Ryan, I, 
I, I, I, you know, the British public will make their decision, right? Like my job is to deliver for them, right? And my job is to deliver for them on their priorities. You know, I believe the country has five priorities. That's why I've made five promises today. Right? Five very simple things that everyone can understand. Halve inflation, grow the economy, reduce debt, cut waiting lists, and stop the boats. Five promises that I have made, five things that my government will focus relentlessly on to make a difference to people's lives. Uh, but also, those things are the foundation of the better future that I want to create for our children and grandchildren. Right? They're not the end of my ambition, they're the start of my ambition. And that's why today I've sketched out what that better future looks like. And although we're not going to get there overnight, um, the things that I talked about are the immediate priorities for us to deliver. I'm confident we can make progress towards that better future as well. And I'm not focused on the politics, I'm not focused on anything else. I'm just focused on delivering on the things that I think are important to people. And that's what I get up to do every day, and that's what the rest of the government does as well. George Parker at the FT. Thank you, uh, Prime Minister. Um, you said at the outset that you wanted to bring peace of mind. Um, I think you're probably aware that in one area at least you're creating more uncertainty and distress, and that's in the area of revoking or repealing up to 4,000 pieces of EU <clears throat> legislation by the end of the year. Um, Twelve organisations from the TUC to the Institute of Directors pleaded with you last year to abandon the end of 2023 deadline. Why don't you give them that assurance today that there won't be this huge upheaval at the end of the year? Well, George, in, you know, in my speech, I talked about the future economy that we need to build, right? And it's an economy that's built on innovation. That is the best way for us to raise our growth rate, which is something I know everybody wants to see. And a big part of that is making sure that we do seize the opportunities of Brexit and make sure that our regulations are agile, that they support innovation and do so particularly in the growth industries of the future. And that's why the Chancellor's talked about delivering exactly that, whether it's in AI, whether it's in quantum, whether it's in life sciences or fintech. And I think that's really important and we are gonna deliver that. And if we do, you know, that's how we create jobs in every part of our country. That's how we make sure people's living standards rise. It's how we spread prosperity. It's how we are competitive around the world. So it's an important part of delivering on making sure that the UK is the most innovative place in the world. And we have new opportunities and freedoms to do that. And we are absolutely going to seize them to deliver for the country. Pippa Creer from The Guardian. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, you say that nurses and NHS staff are special. All the, pub all the polls tell us that the public overwhelmingly agrees, but also that they support the strike action being taken by nurses and hospital workers. You also say you're keen, you're keen on dialogue with the unions. So can you explain why you aren't willing to negotiate their pay? And would you look again at nurses' pensions, bonuses, and holiday pay instead? And finally, can you rule out raising NHS staff salaries by just 2% next year, as you're reportedly planning. Thank you. So, so Pippa, of course the NHS is, is special. Right? It's special to me because of the family that I grew up in, but it's special to all of us because of the care it provides us at times when we really need it. And, and I'm really grateful to our nurses and everyone else in the NHS for the incredible job they do, particularly over the last couple of years, which has been trying for them because of COVID. And when it comes to dialogue, I repeat what I said before, the door is always open for dialogue. The health secretary was out this morning talking to healthcare workers. The rail minister is sitting down with transport unions uh, early next week. And you know, we're always, as I said previously, that we want to have good two-way, open, honest conversations. Uh, those have to be rooted in what's reasonable, what's affordable, what's responsible for the country. And you know, I'm, I'm keen to have those conversations. There's lots of things that we can talk about. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Well, as I said on pay, as conversations need to be based on what is affordable. I think a 19% pay rise is not affordable. I don't think anyone thinks that a 19% pay rise is affordable. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't have dialogue, that we shouldn't have conversations. You talked about next year. It, we're about to start a new process for pay for this year. That's exactly the kind of thing that we should be sitting down and talking to the unions about before everyone submits evidence to that independent process to understand where we're all coming from. And as I say, we'll be setting out uh, you know, more, more of our plans in this regard in the coming days. <laughs> Kate McCann, Talk TV. Thank you, Prime Minister. You've made five promises today, but your predecessors also made a promise, a big one, to reform social care, and you were part of the governments that were supposed to deliver on that. 
they've rowed back, you are accused of doing the same. Now, you've just accepted that one of the biggest challenges the NHS faces is social care. And you've also promised big thinking and no quick fixes, but there's still no plan to deal with the social care problem. So how can people trust you to deliver on five more pledges today when you're yet to deliver on this one? And will you resign if you don't? So, Kate, when you, when you talk about social care, I, I, literally just announced billions of pounds more funding for social care uh, on, on top of the money that I announced as, as Chancellor. So I don't think anyone can say that we're not prioritising social care. It's never had more investment. And the reason it's so important is because not only do people you know, deserve and need high-quality social care, but it is the cause of many of the delays that we're seeing in our urgent care departments and our a &E departments and with ambulances, because as I said, we've got 13,000 people occupying hospital beds that ideally should be back in their communities or in social care settings. So it's a big part of how we actually improve emergency wait times. That's why we've prioritised it. And that's why we have a discharge fund for this winter particularly to do exactly that. It's why we're investing in the social care workforce, something that they've cried out for rightly for years. So, and now we're doing it. We're introducing a sense of career progression for the first time, high quality certification and qualifications and training, all the things that were not there previously that have led to some of the, the kind of high or the low retention rates you've seen in the sector, the vacancies. A big part of the reason for that is people not feeling valued. And that's more than just about how much they're paid. It's about all those other things I talked about. The investment we're putting in is going to deliver that, and people are going to see that change. Um, but you know, what you're talking about, I think, is something slightly different, which is about the caps on care. You know, that has been delivered. Delayed. Yes, because right now we have got an enormous priority as we're all seeing on our TV screens and it's important that we fix that priority and as actually many in local government called on us to do was to delay those reforms so that we could focus that same money, which by the way is still going into social care, but is now being used to deal with the immediate pressures that we're facing. That's the right thing to do. I think everyone agrees that that's the right thing to do because we can't do everything. Uh, and right now, actually just creating more social care capacity, making sure that our social care workers are properly valued, have the respect that they deserve, the career progression that they want. Those are the right priorities. And not only if we do that will we improve social care in this country, we'll also improve the experience people are having currently with ambulances and A&E. And I'm confident that we can make progress on that. Uh, Andy Bell, Channel 5. Thanks, Prime Minister. Um, to all those people who are worried about the state of the NHS, to all those people working in the NHS who wonder if it can keep going, are you really saying there's no more money? You've had what you're getting. It's been announced. There isn't going to be any more. Now you get on with it. Is that what you're saying, in effect, to them? Well, you know, Andy, I'm saying a couple of things. First of all, thank you for the incredible job they do. And I know that over the past two years. We all know that. And also, I grew up in an NHS family. So I know how important high-quality health care is to people. I saw my parents doing it day in, day out for, for decades. Uh, and with regard to resources, you know, it's right that we fund the NHS well, and we are. And that's why, in spite of the difficult decisions we had to make elsewhere, we have found extra money for the NHS and social care. And I think that was recognised by many independent people at the time of the autumn statement, that we had prioritised the NHS, that we had listened and put more funding in. Now, a conversation of uh, you know, how that funding is split up and, and how much should be on pay versus actually having more nurses or how much should be going on more diagnostic equipment, right? Those are the decisions that we and the NHS are making. That's why we have an independent process on pay, rightly, that you know, the RCN, I think, were one of the people they called for it in the 80s, that there should be an independent pay review body process. And the government has respected those decisions. Right, those are independent processes. They make recommendations to the government, in many cases higher, and what, higher than what the government uh, initially suggested and higher than what many people in the private sector are receiving, um, but accepted them in full because you know, that's the right thing to do. But as I said previously to Beth and others and to, to Pippa, it, it, we're always happy to have a dialogue. The door is always open. We're talking about the process for next year. That's exactly the kind of thing we should be sitting down and, and talking through. And it's not just about pay. I'm sure you know, when you are out and about talking to whether it's ambulance workers or others, you know, there, there's things about how their job is working that you know, they would like to see improved. right? And that's some of the things that we did with nurses in the past. They wanted to see more support for their professional development. You know what? We instituted a £1,000 training budget, something the RCN really wanted us to do. It wasn't about pay. It was about supporting nurses once they qualified to be upskilled, to learn more, and to train more. So we put a £1,000 training budget for every nurse and midwife. Right? They wanted nurses' bursaries. 
reintroduced. We deliver that too. It's £5,000 a year for a nurse that's in training. Right? So there's lots of things that are not necessarily paid that are also important, and we should be talking about all these things, and the door is always open to talk about them. Martin Brown, The Express. Thank you, Prime Minister. You said at the end of your speech you'll, you'll make the um, tough calls. And going back to the small boat uh, crisis, will you, um, as part of your plans, will you introduce similar schemes to the Albanian fast deportation scheme? And also, could we expect another offshore uh, processing centre like Rwanda? Uh, thanks, Martin. Well, so with Rwanda, first of all, I'm, I'm really pleased that we had the court ruling that we had, which made it clear that Rwanda is a safe country, that it is completely fine for us to be able to send people there to have their claims processed, and indeed that that's in keeping with the Refugee Convention and other international treaties that we are uh, a signatory to. You know, we need to make sure that that policy works. Uh, it's an important part of our plan to tackle the small boats that we're seeing. Um, you know, in terms of what more we can do vis-a-vis -vis Albania, look, Albania in one sense was a special case because it accounted, that one country accounted for a third of all small boat arrivals at one point uh, last year, so, and, it's, and it's clearly a safe country. It's a country where France, Belgium, many others, Germany, um, Scandinavian countries all return 98% of illegal uh, asylum seekers. We were only rejecting 45%. That clearly isn't right. And our new deal and our new changes in process will move us into alignment with other countries. More generally, um, we do need to look at one of the things I mentioned at the time of the, the announcement was returns agreements. You know, where, where we have uh, people who are here who shouldn't be here, you know, we need to make sure that the returns agreements we have with countries are working. And you know, we've, we've taken powers in legislation that we passed earlier this year to impose visa penalties where that makes sense on countries that are not cooperating in receiving back failed asylum seekers from us. Uh, and that should be a part of the conversations we're having with countries around the world. And we're seeing good progress uh, on those. And that's one of the parts of the plan that we need to deliver on as well, uh, you know, working and functioning returns agreements. So that's, that will be a bit of a focus for next year as well. But you know, it's deliberately one of the five promises I made today. I think it's a top priority for the country. I think people saw that I'd spent time on it and come up with a, a clear and sensible way to make progress on it last month. And the job for this year is to keep making progress and deliver on that. Uh, Martina Batetto from PA. Martina, where are you? Um, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, you want to introduce new laws to stop illegal migration. But why is more legislation necessary, given the Nationality and Borders Act was recently passed? Is this an admission that the laws passed by the previous Tory government have failed to do what was promised? So, Martina, I just want to make sure that we fix this problem. And having had this job for a few weeks and spent time thinking about it, you know, my belief is that we do need new laws if we want to actually comprehensively deal uh, with this challenge. The system that I want to deliver is one whereby if someone comes to our country illegally, they won't have the right to stay, they can be detained and sent back to their own home or a safe alternative uh, if their own home isn't appropriate. I think that's a common sense system. I think it's a reasonable and fair system. Uh, and that's what we need legislation to deliver. And that's the legislation that we will introduce in due course. But it's one of my five promises for a reason, as I said. It's an incredibly important priority for the country. It's an important priority for me. Uh, and as I think hopefully people have already seen, we've begun to deliver on it. And there'll be more to come this year. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much all for your time. It's been a great pleasure. And have a good 2023.